Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, today we embrace the season through art, innovation, and healthy food. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, corner store revival. So much more than milk and lotto tickets. And keeping the winter weight gain to a minimum with tasty salads. But first, when areas and avatars mix, a night at the opera video game style. Now here's a story that just screams our city. This is a combination of technology and art. The country's first opera hackathon is being held here right now. And Nilesh Nair is in charge of the online production at Renaissance Opera. Hello there. Hi there, nice to meet you. Well, nice to meet you too. So what happens at, a, at an opera hackathon? Cool, so hackathons are something that's pretty common in the software and game development field. And uh, it's just where you bring a group of individuals together, creatives, professionals, and get them to make something uh, unique using uh, whatever tools uh, and software they have. So with this opera hackathon, we've uh, come together and decided to bring groups of opera professionals uh, who are well versed in theater and performance and staging, lighting, those kinds of skills, and bring them together with game developers and software developers who have um, uh, technical skills and put these groups together and see what kind of cool projects they can create. Let's make some magic here. But why is this being done? I mean, what's the need right now for, for the opera community? So uh, I think the big part of this started during um, the last few years of the pandemic uh, where um, opera professionals were looking for ways to get their art uh, and creativity and stories out uh, you know, to their audiences. But unfortunately, we weren't able to bring people together into um, the, the theaters and opera houses uh, as usual. So uh, they started looking for different ways to connect with uh, a global wider audience. And uh, technology and the tools now have allowed us to really create some fantastic experiences um, and so uh, this was the reason why um, Renaissance decided to bring these uh, communities together. To well, see it's we a do. really cool idea. And just how challenging is this for you as an animator? I mean, how do you know you, you get it right, match the voice with the avatar? Yeah, it's pretty challenging. Um, the, the technology is always changing and improving. Uh, so staying on top of it is probably one of the main challenges to, to make sure that everything is uh, lined up correctly, uh, as you were saying. So uh, we, we try our best and uh, I think it's still kind of improving. But uh, I hope that uh, people will see some of the results uh, from from this hackathon and, and other things to come that, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty close to. Well, nice. and what, what effect does it have on the art form itself? How does it change it? So uh, I think uh, previously, you know, you, you can tend to be restricted by budgets and, uh, you know, which is, allows you to only have certain elements in your sets and certain uh, amount of performers and uh, special effects and so on. But in this case, since everything is done digitally, you know, the teams can be a lot uh, more smaller and you're doing everything inside a... Uh, you know, inside software, so you can kind of scale up as much as your imagination allows. And it allows you to use tools like VR and AR and all these other upcoming technologies to really augment and enhance your performances in ways not seen before. Well, and we have seen other musicians delve into this sort of thing, right? I mean, ABBA is doing a hologram tour. What would you say is the, the advantage for performers? I think uh, for performers, it's a unique chance to um, to add uh, extra elements into their performance, um, to interact in a digital virtual space. And as we're sort of moving towards uh, things like the metaverse, to see performers coming into that space using these tools that software developers have been playing with for a while uh, and adding in their creative energy, it really show it really is an unexplored field. There's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Now, Nilesh, just what about for you personally? How did you get into this type of project? 
Well, funnily enough, uh, I was asked to join the team uh, with, the, with the sense of creating a hack, uh, a hackathon experience in itself, where we came together to create a, a VR experience where uh, the story was based on uh, Greek mythology of uh, Orpheus and uh, Eurydice. And, uh, and we, we, we created this full virtual reality experience where, uh, you know, an audience member can, can st uh, stay inside VR and watch these uh, characters uh, put together a beautiful performance around them and even interact uh, with this performance. Well, and what was it like as, as you, you tried to gather and recruit some of these indie gamers to work with you on this? I think we're seeing a lot of interest. There's a lot of people who know now what the tools are capable of and have been using these game engines uh, for a long time to create cool experiences. And for them, they were always looking for creatives uh, to come in and help give them those uh, ideas and create the worlds together. So I think there's been a nice uh, uh, merging of like-minded communities here. Well, it sounds like quite a fantastic project. What are you hoping is the, the outcome of this hackathon? So we have uh, several teams that we've organized and divided based on um, their skill sets. So we're really hoping to see really cool projects come out that uh, reimagine what uh, opera can, can look like in this digital space. And, uh, and we hope that, that these teams uh, get something really nice out of it. Well, sure. So how, how about the audience? How does the audience access the, the online performances once you're done? So some of these online performances are streamed live on YouTube uh, and uh, will then be available uh, as YouTube uh, videos uh, on, on Renaissance's channel. And uh, for the other projects created through the hackathon, we will be updating the website with, uh, with, you know, with the final results. Have a great time with it, Nilesh. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Gloria. Hi. My name is Michael, and this is our Vancouver. All right, it's time for one of our favorite features where we get to showcase a number of the photographs sent in by you, our audience. Let's start with this one. Belle Bax was out for a lovely walk in Queen Elizabeth Park recently and took in all the splendor of the fall colors. Belle, thank you so much. It has been an amazing season. And Naomi Moore was at Ambleside Beach and captured a wave going over the seawall at just the right time. Amazing light in that image. Thank you. And finally, Zarmina Tariq took in a beautiful moment on Crescent Beach and shared this with us. Look at the cloud formation there, just wonderful. And do send us more, it's easy. Just email some of your favorite photographs to us at bcphotos at cbc.ca, bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, if you've been out walking through a Port Moody Park, you may have noticed this phone, it's there but it's not hooked up to anything. The phone is a way for those who have lost loved ones to channel their grief. Akshay Kulkarni spoke to one woman who uses that phone to connect with her brother. In 2020, my little brother passed away of an overdose. I was spending the last year just really, really grieving. He didn't have a burial, he doesn't have a plaque, he was cremated, and I didn't really have anywhere to go to talk to him. Hey, Henry. It's a phone hooked up to nothing. But picking up the handset is a way for Brooke Robichaud to speak to her brother Henry, who died of an overdose when he was 23. I wish I could have you to hang out with the kids again. The first time I picked up the phone to talk to my brother was very uncomfortable and awkward. <laughs> um, it's a new thing. I've never done anything like that before. but. Handing the phone to my daughter and just seeing her smile and saying, hi, Uncle Henry, and, you know, connecting with him and getting to keep his memory alive, I honestly was in tears. The phone of the wind is tucked away in this healing garden at Pioneer Memorial Park. The people who set it up wanted to be an outlet for anyone needing to channel their grief. Traditionally, if you look at hospitals and even hospices, like death and grief are kind of tucked behind closed doors. Um, and they don't have to be. The phone of the wind is one of the many ways that people can uh, use to mourn, to externalize that grief from the inside and to make it uh, go public from the outside. This phone is modeled after one in Japan, set up after the 2011 tsunami. The phone to nowhere in Port Moody 
is the first of its kind in Metro Vancouver, and it's already being used by many trying to remember their loved ones lost. Nearly five British Columbians died every day from overdoses last year. And Robichaud says people who have lost others shouldn't be afraid to grieve publicly. And it's such a cool idea. I've put it on my TikTok and my Instagram, and so many people have reached out just saying, I wish this was in my city, I wish this was in my country. We'll come here probably about once a week at least. We like to go play at the park across the street, so on the way we'll stop in and say hi to my brother and, you know, just have that moment. A moment so that she can always feel connected. Akshay Kulkarni, CBC News, Port Moody. Akshay, thank you so much for that very touching story. Now, the COP26 UN Conference on Climate Change continues in Glasgow, and while world leaders debate the best way forward, local youth are finding their own way to protect their future. Naisha Khan is a member of the sustainability teams, and she is urging us to be more inclusive of all racial communities in the climate movement. My name is Naisha Khan, and I am a second-generation Bangladeshi settler on stolen and unceded Hauntland, KT, and Semiamu land. I've been a climate justice organizer for nearly two years with the organization Sustainability Teens and Banking on a Better Future. And in this episode, I'm going to explore through my personal experiences why it is essential to view the movement through an intersectional lens. When we imagine climate activists, we often imagine someone who is white, and this is intentional. The climate movement, specifically starting with the conservation movement, is deeply rooted in white supremacy. From the outset, it focused on saving the environment from the effects of climate change, but in doing so, it has failed to protect the racialized communities affected by the same environmental degradation. It has erased these struggles and the inequity that they experience as their communities have been ravaged by climate change. This history of exclusion impacts BIPOC in the climate movement. Our work continues to be erased, white supremacy continues to manifest, and it continues to harm BIPOC. I have personally experienced micro and macro aggressions, tokenism, and just a general lack of cultural understanding that has made me want to leave this movement at times. I feel like a resource or a prop often asked to speak up about any race-related issue, whether it be BLM or Indigenous sovereignty, because I am just automatically categorized as this non-white organizer, regardless of the fact that the struggles of different communities and individuals are unique. Despite this reality, there are still times when I have felt safe, heard, and respected in this movement. And the key to these spaces was an understanding of intersectionality. But what is intersectionality? The concept of intersectionality was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw in her paper, demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex. Intersectionality recognizes that we live in a society characterized by multiple systems of oppression, including sexism, colonialism, and racism. And these systems are all intertwined. These systems of oppression do not work exclusively to oppress one specific group at a time, but instead overlap and work together to compound oppression for intersecting groups. Within the climate movement, we need to be aware of and take action to deconstruct these systems of oppression. Otherwise, we are replicating the same systems of colonialism and capitalism that caused this crisis in the first place. The key to successful inclusive movements that center marginalized voices is intersectionality. Here are some of my asks to ensure intersectionality is upheld. Center and uplift BIPOC voices. No matter how educated you are, you'll never have the lived experience of someone else. You'll never truly understand their emotions or the depth of their oppression. So instead of speaking for others, work to uplift marginalized voices so that they can speak for themselves. This is especially important because BIPOC communities are at the center of the climate crisis and have extensive knowledge and lived experience to share. Unlearn white supremacy, but not at the cost of my emotional labor. There are so many existing resources out there, Black, Indigenous, and POC written content that you can find online. 
do not unnecessarily labor the BIPOC folk in your life because this work is hard for us. It is tiring and I'm more than just a resource. I'm a person who needs rest and care. Incorporating hope. Indigenous and other communities of color have been practicing sustainability for years whilst building mutual aid and other practices of community care. We have the solution. We just need to center different voices to make it a reality. And lastly, celebrate BIPOC joy. Too often racialized folk are reduced to sob stories and to our traumas when, in fact, we're full-fledged people capable of experiencing joy and love. For me, I am slowly starting to center joy in my organizing. Systems of oppression are rooted in hate hate for the other, hate for ourselves, but by centering joy, especially as a marginalized person, I am committing an act of anti-oppression. When fighting the climate crisis, it is absolutely necessary to use an intersectional and anti-oppressive lens. This both works to center marginalized and racialized voices, but it also works to dismantle centuries of oppression that caused this emergency in the first place. I know it may seem like a lot to care about all of these different issues when one just wants to fight for climate action, but this crisis did not just occur and its impacts will not occur equally. The systems of oppression that caused this in the first place will also shape its effects and in order to truly combat it, we must unite movements because our fight is not separate. Our liberation is bound together. Coming up, for the second year in a row, we've run through a full alphabet of hurricane names. Johanna Wagstaff will be here to explain how a warming ocean is to blame for more storms. Tropical storm Wanda, forming in early November, became the 21st named storm of the Atlantic hurricane season. Well, Wanda is not expected to pose a danger to land, Wanda's formation means we have officially exhausted the list of names used to identify storms, and this is the second time in two years that that's happened. Okay, first of all, what happened to X, Y, and Z, or if you're doing the math, for the letter Q or U for that matter, well, in the Atlantic Hurricane Basin, there are just not enough names that begin with those letters for the list that gets rotated every six years. After Wanda, the National Weather Service will use a list of supplemental names. It's only the third time it has had to do that. The first year was in 2005. Last year, there was a record-breaking 30 named storms, including six major hurricanes, forcing meteorologists to use Greek letters to identify the final nine storms. But in March, citing confusion among the general public, the World Meteorological Organization said it would no longer use the Greek alphabet to label storms and would instead rely on a supplemental list of 21 new names, beginning with Adria, Braylon, and Caridad and ending with Viviana and Will. Hopefully we won't get there, but the links between hurricanes and climate change are becoming more apparent. A warming planet can expect stronger hurricanes over time and a higher incident of the most powerful storms. The overall number of storms though, not increasing in the records we have because of factors like stronger wind shear as keeping those weaker storms from actually forming. Hurricanes are also becoming wetter because of more water vapor in a warmer atmosphere and rising sea levels are contributing to higher storm surge, the most destructive element of tropical cyclones. It's been a busy hurricane season in the Atlantic Ocean this year as well, and there's still a few more weeks to go until it officially ends on November 30th. And now, you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get an answer. Johanna, thanks very much. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. So November is a month where some of you might try to eat and drink maybe in a healthier way. A lot of people take the month off of alcohol, for example. They call it dry vember, or maybe keep sugar at a minimum in preparation for a Christmas party. That season is coming uh, pretty soon as well. Now, Field & Social is a go-to place 
for salads and not just summer salads either. Stuart Boyles is back with us again. Stuart, hello there. Hi, Gloria. How are you? Thanks for having me on today. Well, thank you. So you're going to show us how you make one of your signature salads. Uh, what do you want to take us through today? Well, that's great. So first of all, we have a few of our uh, fall salads. Obviously, like you said, fall is actually a great month for salads. There's lots of great root vegetables, hearty vegetables, grains are really good, a little bit heavier in some of the flavors. Um, one of the ones I like to do is it's not really on the heavy side. It's more of a Thai-style peanut salad. Um, it's kind of my take on it. Uh, it's just a bit of lettuce. Um, and I have these really delicious kind of spicy garlic noodles with lots of chili, mm. um, peanut oil. Yeah, and they go in there. They're kind of like stick noodles that you get in a pad thai. Lots of, lots of really strong flavors to make them stand out with the dressing and all of the fresh veggies. Um, it has a little bit of red peppers are beautiful in there. Uh, I like to use jicama because it's kind of got a really nice crunch to it, but it's quite neutral with some carrots. Yeah, and it holds Those its crunch, the, the jicama, doesn't it? It doesn't doesn't get saturated yeah. normally. It holds it holds a nice crispy crunch all the way through. No, yeah, it's wonderful. I find like daikon or radish tends to kind of die with the dressing and the vinegar, but I think uh, jicama really stands stands out. Uh, we have some beautiful uh, cucumber, um, tomatoes. I'd love to have someone like you chop everything up in advance for me <laughs> and just throw it all oh, together you make it look so it's easy all, it's it's <laughs> all it is it's all so easy um and we have a beautiful peanut dressing so this has like roasted peanuts lots of chilies rice wine vinegar and we do it with a tamari um i like to say like i don't you know if, if you can make something gluten-free by default you might as well do it but it still appeals to everyone that likes gluten so use a bit of tamari in that and nice lots of flavor mixing that up and again, that's why you want the noodles to be kind of spiced with the, with the roasted garlic. Um, so they really stand out as a kind of like a, a punch as you're eating the salad. And mix that all together. And what we actually serve with this is tempeh. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with tempeh, but tempeh is like a fermented soybean product. It's gluten-free. It's great for vegans. This is a vegan salad. Well, and it satisfies uh, it, that need it, for just a, a bite of something, right? Just a good bite. A, bite of something when you don't want tofu, uh, you don't want a meat substitute product. This is really nice. It's got a great texture to it as well that roasts up really nice. And that's our salad right there. That's our kind of Thai peanut salad. And I like to put a little extra, little extra peanuts on there. We have some other salads that we just put on the menu as well. This one's a hearty uh, grain bowl. Um, it's basically wild rice with steel cutouts. Now I haven't seen really many people uh, do a steel cutout salad, but I find it's fantastic. <laughs> marinated with a nice vinaigrette, some Wait, apples, wait a second, some... wait a second. Steel cut oat salad. So do you soak them first? Do you cook them first? Or do you have them, you can't have them in there raw and chewy. Yeah. No, I kind of had to kind of come up with the method, but basically lots of extra water, uh, cook them up with the lots of those. They don't turn to porridge. And then once they're cooked, it's kind of like a couscous consistency and run under cold water so that it kind of makes them light and flaky. My wife's from Scotland, so we eat a lot of oats around the house. And I just had the great idea to do a steel cut oat salad. Wild rice in there as well. Uh, this has a honey and balsamic dressing, which is really, really nice with some yams. It's hearty. It's got all those kind of winter flavors. The other one we have, this is a fully vegan, oh no, a fully vegetarian salad. It's got some chopped egg in it but it's spicy broccoli salad. So we roast the broccoli and lots of mushrooms and hit it with lots of sriracha and flavors, a bit of cabbage, uh, peppers, and uh, spinach. And this one is the Thai salad, which I just made for you. And this is a nice uh, vegetarian salad as well. So we did uh, roasted chickpeas. So marinate the chickpeas and roast them. I think chickpeas out of a tin are not that great, but roast them in the oven for like five minutes, kind of dries them out a bit and gives them a nice kind of hearty, kind of roasted texture. And then a little bit of feta cheese, cucumbers, and then that's a red pepper hummus that we make at the store. And that's just squeegeed on, squeezed on top with some uh, crisp pita chips. So that's kind of a nice, these are all kind of nice fall-based salads. So. I love that idea. And I'm just curious, like, where do you come up with your ideas? Do you all sit around a table and say, I know, let's try this? Or are you just always, always on the hunt for new flavors and combinations? 
I think it's always ingredients. I mean, you have ingredients that kind of stick with you over the years. And when the, for me, I know, I, you know, over the years I've been working in kitchens whenever, you know, when I was working in, you know, the UK, it was like artichokes were in season or asparagus. It's time to cook that now. And a lot of the ingredients we have here, especially like chickpeas and kind of the yams and apples, you know, I'm not really serving apples in the, in the summertime. But when the, when the winter comes along, I think it's always a great time to serve apples, the hearty grains, um, you know, couscous, we serve a lot of couscous and uh, quinoa, but those are quite light and fluffy where I think, you know, I want something a little hearty. So I think it's always talking, talking with the team. Uh, I've got a great, uh, great group of people working in the kitchens with me, asking them ideas and trying to kind of work together to see what would we like to cook. And, and you know, I mean, everything's fairly simple to do, but I think uh, the nice thing for us is everything's made from scratch in our kitchens. And everyone kind of enjoys doing it together. So. Well, and I also like the idea of the salad as the, you know, the starter, the main, and, and it's everything in one bowl or on one plate. Do, do you have a favorite salad for, for this time of year? Uh, well, I mean, I'm quite... I'm quite partial to the peanut salad. I, I really like the noodles. I like the I like the kick of all the spices and chilies, and uh, I like the 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 crunch of the refreshing veggies with it. And I, I'm getting into eating a lot of tempeh myself, so uh, that would be my favorite. Um, well, salad this thank time you here. so much for taking us into another season with your salad, Stuart. Uh, great to talk to you again. Thank you. You as well. Thanks so much. Take care. want to go and see some live music, Dallas Green is known as City in Colour on stage. The Canadian indie singer plays two nights at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre, November 12th and 13th. And Chutzpah Festival is on until November 24th. There's a long lineup of performances in all forms of theater, music, comedy, and dance. Just go to the website for more details. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music here to introduce you to an incredible Canadian singer who you may have seen before. Her name is Aviv and she hails from Toronto. Check out this brand new single from Aviv called Love of Your Life. You try to Yeah, that is the dreamy, confident sound of Aviv, a bedroom pop artist from Toronto. So who is this Aviv? Well, one of the most immediately remarkable aspects of Aviv Cohen is her age. She is only 15 years old, but she has been honing her skills for a long time. Aviv began her voice training at the Bravo Academy for the Performing Arts at age four. Piano started at age six. And then acting in shows like American Gothic, Working Moms, and Anne of Green Gables. Aviv was also even a member of the storied franchise, The Mini Pops Kids. Did you spot Aviv in there? That was Aviv during her time in Mini Pops Kids covering Bruno Mars in high energy fashion. Hope she doesn't mind us showing a bit of that footage. These days in her mid-teens, it's Aviv's original music that is catching ears and quite frankly, blowing people away with tunes like this one with a jangly vintage pop feel. go recommended if you like always Bell and Sebastian or Veronica Falls that is Aviv with Front Lawn now Aviv also has a song that is currently percolating up the CBC Music Top 20 right now another tasty tune called Black Coffee 
It's a great song there. That is Aviv with Black Coffee. It is steaming up the CBC Music Top 20 right now. And that is the song that you need to add to your Perk Up playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence for CBC Music. Check out Aviv, and I'll check in with you next week. And coming up, the corner store reimagined to include music and tasty treats. You're watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, since the pandemic hit, we have recognized the importance of the local corner store. East Vancouver's iconic Vernon Drive grocer has new owners, and they're bringing good beets, fresh bread, and local artists. The CBC's Anita Bath took a look. Tell us, first of all, why you wanted to buy this place. It's been a very interesting year and a half to two years for a lot of people, pretty much everybody. So, you know, we want to take this opportunity to create a space where people can kind of connect again and enjoy life again and um, rise up their vibrations. With this space here, we're creating an opportunity for a lot of people to be seen and heard. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is making community convenient and and that would mean providing a warm space that'll have a lot of delicious food, a lot of great music, uh, amazing service. We want to showcase a lot of the local creatives and artisans, artisans in our city that don't necessarily have uh, the vessel or the venue to sell their products. So each of you brings something different to Rise Up Market. What I've learned a lot is that like, you know, separating people actually allowed people to really value and, and appreciate what they have in each other. The rebirth of the corner store is happening all over. Um, are you hoping that with another one here that you're going to be fueling a bigger trend? Yes, definitely. Yeah. We, I, we, want to, we want to create an absolutely new narrative of what, of what it means to shop at a convenience store. And I also yeah. noticed up front you have a little arcade game. Yeah, that was something that <laughs> Rags and I decided to bring in. Um, you know, we're big kids at heart, and again, we're across from the school, and I have children, so we thought we'd bring in something simple and classic for them to play. It's a very simple game and it's just, you know, it's a good way to pass the time. Oh yeah, this is awesome. Take your mind off whatever might be stressing you in life and just kind of escape for a little while and have fun. Oh my gosh, I forgot how much fun this is. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, it's addictive. Oh no! Nice. Anita, thanks so much for that. Well, there's another retail story that's making news right now. Food prices increased in Canada by about 4% since last year. Some people are finding ways to get around the high costs. As Benit Brach tells us, the strategy is saving them thousands. Last year, we probably bought uh, 600 boxes worth of cereal. Along with rice, instant coffee, gravy, and lots of this. Ellen's and his wife are extreme couponers with an appetite for low grocery bills and donating goods to others. When you learn to save on dairy and meat, you learn to save on cell phone bills and any other type of bills. They use apps like Flip, which lists flyers from various stores to use for price matching. With Checkout 51, you can earn cash back by redeeming offers. And with a 10% jump in meat since the beginning of the year, apps are a big help. We'll use Flip, Primary Bros will buy, the wife will buy 12 at a, at a time. 
Beyond technology, these stacks of coupons still do the trick as well. We're probably saving five to ten thousand a year on on our groceries. Okay, so maybe not everyone's at this level of couponing, but a recent study shows just under 40% of British Columbians are using coupons more this year than last year. 42% are using more flyers, and people also look for goods that are about to expire. With this new app, 130 local stores in Vancouver have partnered up to make surprise bags with heavily discounted surplus food. You get the, uh, the value of the bag, so say a value is $15, you get it for one third of the value. So that's significant savings for the consumer for a meal that otherwise would have been thrown out. And if coupons, apps and bulk buying aren't an option, experts say you can stick to something simple, a shopping list. Staying organized even helps this extreme couponer land some bargains. Barbecue sauces, we uh, most of the time we're getting them absolutely free. We pick up hundreds and hundreds of them. For Ellen and his wife, it's all about catching the next good deal and paying it forward. We're giving away all 300 on our next round. We're giving that away and it really does make us feel good that we're giving back because we, we for every $100 that we're giving away is probably only costing us $10 to do so. And it's going a long way for them and people in need. Benit Brach, CBC News, Abbotsford. Hi, I'm Alex. Hi, my name is Claudia. I am Bruna. This, this is, is our Vancouver. Vancouver. Well, we enjoy our morning cup of coffee. We might not be thinking about just how much land has been cleared to make way for the crops. Scientists in Finland have been figuring out a way to enjoy the Joe and protect the planet. It's coffee made without beans. Just watch. Climate change is front and center for, for the coffee industry because we're seeing throughout the tropical coffee belt, farmers being impacted by climate change. We uh, propose an alternative process here. Um, we skip the farming part and we use uh, plant cell cultures instead. So actually real coffee cell cultures, but they are not uh, generated in the field, uh, but instead we are growing them in bioreactors. There's a noticeable roasted odor. Then depending on the roast level, it can be also quite fruity, uh, quite green. It tastes a combination of different types of coffees. All the natural coffee <laughs> sources like, um, are vanishing, so we have to move along. But yes, I think when the day comes and if it tastes, then uh, it's like the aroma is coffee-based, so why not? And in the long run, really, one could imagine that this replaces part of the production pipeline. Uh, but to be honest, I would think there is always segments uh, relying on the traditional coffee and for special grades and specialty coffees for sure. Coming up, could a hybrid model of work from home and in the office be the best of both worlds? Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Have you been working from home since the pandemic hit? Well, a new survey says half of Canadian workers think that doing their jobs remotely could hold them back in their careers. But employers can take steps to address those kinds of fears. As Janella Hamilton is finding out, the future of work for many in BC includes a hybrid model. It's been more than a year since Amanda Thomas stepped into her office at Coast Capital Savings in Coquitlam. And while she misses interacting with colleagues, she says the flexibility of working from home has given her family a healthier work-life balance. That was probably the most challenging time of the pandemic for me, having the kids home and working some of the longest hours of my life. Thomas will continue to work remotely for the foreseeable future, and she's not alone. A 
According to a new Angus Reid survey sponsored by technology firm Cisco Canada, 74% of BC employees say their companies are also planning to continue with a hybrid or remote work model. I think most businesses are going to be hybrid moving forward. And again, I think it gets back to that 77% of Canadians are saying, hey, this you know, flexibility and choice is really important to my employment decision. And while working from home has its benefits, it can also bring challenges. The survey suggests 46% of BC employees feel working in person will bring more opportunities for workplace engagement and career growth compared to working remotely. Thomas says she understands why working remotely can bring on a feeling of neglect. I personally take it on myself to advocate for myself and to make it be known what I'm working on and, and how much value I'm bringing to the organization. Anya Cox works with Thomas and is the chief people officer of Coast Capital. She says it's up to managers to check in with their staff to ensure their needs are being met. With this move to having a much more flexible workforce, we've also been very thoughtful about what do we need to provide to our employees so that people do continue to feel included? Tara Robertson is a workplace consultant. She says there are easy ways for employers to support people working remotely, including asking them how they're doing and making sure they're seen, quite literally. Creating the meeting norms when we're in a hybrid environment. So the, I think the best practice is for everyone to be on their own computer so you can see everyone's face and like their facial expressions and body language. Cisco Canada says the right approach will vary across workplaces, but the overall takeaway is to prioritize personal well-being as well as flexible work arrangements, since this hybrid model could be the future of work in B.C. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Coquitlam. Well, the high cost of living in the Lower Mainland has long been an issue. We have reported for decades on all the creative ways people have found affordable housing. Well, let's take you back to 1982 through the CBC archives and the story of a student who took to the trees. Blair Longley is a writer and a part-time student at Simon Fraser University. With the cost of tuition, books and other expenses, there just isn't enough left at the end of the month for conventional housing. But Blair is lucky. He's managed to find a place that's cheap, quiet, and close to classes, what you might call getting to the root of the housing problem. The 31-year-old student is living in a 1,500-year-old tree stump on top of Burnaby Mountain. In uh, 1954, a uh, person who was a medical student at UBC, that was before there was any Simon Fraser University, uh, looking for a place to retreat, came up on the mountain and built the original A-frame loft on top. There's probably been at least a dozen students who have lived in it since then. When the winter is kind of damp and uh, a little cold, but uh, it's not so bad since I'm near the university and can, you know, retreat to the those facilities, but uh, in the summer it's beautiful. Is this a alternative student housing, would you describe it? Yeah, that's what I would call it, is alternative student housing. There's a, quite a shortage of student housing here, a serious shortage, and uh, uh, not everybody uh, could do this. There's only about six stumps on the mountain this size. Do you feel like there's something of a recluse living in here? Well, I would be if I was on some other mountain, but since I'm in the middle of a metropolis and I just have to uh, walk out, you know, a short trail to be in the middle of a university community, I don't feel very much of a recluse. It's sort of living in the best of both worlds. But for Longley and future stump dwellers, that ideal balance is being threatened. Already, construction is underway on a new four-lane ring road to service the university, and by next summer, that road will pass just a few hundred feet from the stump. Jim Oaks for CBC News on Burnaby Mountain. When we bring you stories here at CBC Vancouver, we have award-winning photographers out capturing the images that say so much. Still images add context and bring a lot more to the understanding of an event or an issue. Here are some of the latest from what was happening this past week. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. For now, bye-bye.